so, so we are going to uh, listen about one of the biggest trends in the software industry for the last couple of years. Fasten your seat belts because we have a doctor here. Dr. Fatim <laughs> Pankov is going to... Not a show. medical one. <laughs> Not a medical <laughs> one, but still, still a doctor. <laughs> So, so yeah, we're going to see what deep learning can and cannot do. Please, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, a few words about me. Uh, who's going to waste your 40 minutes? The main thing you need to know about me, I've been thinking about intelligent robots and building intelligent robots ever since I was the age of six. Fortunately, I managed to make it my job. I did my PhD at an amazing lab at the University of Edinburgh, where we had pretty much any single robot you can imagine. The human-to-robot ratio was towards the robots by a factor of five. So we had plenty of robots. And for the past two and a half years, I was, I was team lead and a research scientist at a company called 5AI, where uh, we were building this beast. I can tell a bit more about it after this. Um, and yeah, I've been writing software for all sorts of robots. And at the end of the day, it really is writing software. So exactly two months ago, I got tired. Every single time you get a new platform, you get new data, you have to come up with a program. Every single time it's kind of the same. So I was like, okay, can't we actually automate this process? That's why exactly two years ago, I started a company called Cyro Research, where what we specialize is in extracting programs from raw data. Hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll see why this is useful and why we really need to do it to advance what AI can do for us. Okay, so I work in the field of autonomous agents, which involves artificial intelligence and robotics. If I go to a party and people ask me, what do you do? I have two options. I can tell them I do artificial intelligence. Then very quickly, the topic becomes AlphaGo, a deep neural network, beating the world champion in Go, and everybody freaking out about super intelligence taking over the world, and so on. Don't worry about it, because I can also talk about robots. And if I talk about robots, we always end up on this video. <laughs> right? So on one hand, on one hand, we can beat the world champion in Go, an extremely complicated game very few of us can play. On the other hand, something that everybody can do, a million dollar robot and a team uh, of multiple scientists cannot do. What is the problem? Hopefully today, I'll show you what the problem is. So, the first thing, the big trend, deep neural networks. How many of you have used deep neural networks or read anything about deep neural networks? Okay, considerable amount. Very good. So whatever, what hype you hear, they're going to take over the world. No, they're not. They're just some functions. That's what a new deep neural network is. It's essentially a function which takes some input, produces some output. It has some architecture and some parameters that we train. That's it. Nothing else. Functions, they might be nonlinear, complicated, but it's just a function. They can compose, which is interesting and useful. Why do they work nowadays? Because we figured out a way to run them on the GPU. We can write them as linear algebra. And GPUs are great at linear algebra. Hence, we have some insane architectures. This one, for example, is a neural network, actually three of them. You can see how many compositions you have. So here, these are three networks. This one, for example, has 34 layers. So you have 34 functions passing into another function, into another function, and so on. You can think of it as a 34 layer uh, call stack. So this is what neural networks are. What can, it, what can they do? I think they started becoming trend again, beginning of 2010s, like 2012, something like this. And the first thing that really got my attention was this one. So what happens if you take, uh, back then, the, the day image of the Curiosity rover self-checking on Mars, and the first abstract art using chessboard pattern, right? I had any, any guesses what would happen? Well, you can create something quite interesting with neural networks. You can combine them. You can do style transfer. You can do things which I cannot do. I, I, I assume many of you cannot, cannot do. Maybe there's some amazing artists, but that's hard. It's really difficult and also touches on something that everybody has been claiming. Computers cannot do art. Maybe they do. Next thing, around 2014-15, uh, DeepMind, a company now owned by Google, announced we managed to beat humans on, all the, on some of the Atari games and has anyone played an Atari game? Yes, yeah, some of you. There was a workshop on Friday. We actually implemented this particular paper 
um, and we trained an agent to play Pong. How did they do it? They used a huge neural network. What were the results? Uh, this is the network. You just have some image in the, uh, in, as an input, pixels, raw pixels, and your network selects actions that it has to output, and you have lots of layers of functions passing to the next function, to the next function, and so on. How did we do? Well, any game that you see above this line, we did better than humans. And at the top, you'll see, for example, Pinball and Breakout and, and Pong was also somewhere here. We do better than humans. That's amazing. Let's be scientists. Let's ask the hard question. What's here at the bottom? All right, there's this game, Montezuma. It does exactly 0%. Interesting. Next thing, Go. Anyone plays Go? OK, two people, amazing. I'm still trying, I'm still trying. It's really hard to pick up. But uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, AlphaGo, or AlphaZero, winning against the Grandmaster back then. How did they do it? Again, they used a very classic algorithm called Monte Carlo Tree Search, where you would essentially build the whole tree of the game and try and learn what's best. In chess, for example, which we won against humans in 97 or something, uh, 1997, um, you can play the whole game. In Go, you cannot. The search space is too big. That's why what we did, we said, yeah, we're not going to play it at the end. We're actually just going to do the next move and try and have a neural network evaluate how good our move is. And hopefully by it self-playing can actually learn what the value of each action is. This is how the networks look like in this case. OK, so we won Go. This is Google Translate. I guess many of you use Google Translate. Well, uh, don't be surprised, but from 2000, I think 16, they use neural network that does all the translation. Essentially, they have a neural network that translates to an intermediate representation and then to, from any language to this intermediate representation, and then from this intermediate representation to any other language. That's why for, uh, it started working so well, especially for more popular languages. Interestingly, if you go on a website called Archive, where we scientists love to put our work there. You can see what the work and what the state was in 2016. I'm not saying it's easy, especially with Google. They make it at large scales. But uh, the core of it is just neural networks, which, as you know now, they're just nonlinear functions, nothing else. Something else. This is actually quite new. I think this, was, this uh, came out two weeks ago. Face forensics. I guess you've all heard about fake news fake videos, fake images, so on. So this is an initiative, again, by Google to actually try and classify fake videos, videos that are artificially synthesized. Because what we can do nowadays with a technique called generative adversarial networks, we can take a source video and actually make, for example, this actor perform whatever this actor did and just swap their faces and so on. So if you go on GitHub, there is this face forensic repository with a huge data set. And these videos, all of them, Regardless of how good they look, they're actually fake. None of them is real. It's all synthesized from data. And none of these people actually did what they do in this video. So we can do amazing things. We can do amazing things with those. And by now, you're probably all confused. The title was, what can deep learning do? And I'm talking about what it can do. Well, let's start thinking about what it cannot do. The first thing we're going to talk about is generalization. What is the problem of generalization? Well, it turns out it's a very serious one. So here is a nice plot of us trying to learn the most simple data relation we can imagine, identity. We want a function where we take an input x and we output x. That's it, as simple as this. We train our network on the region from minus 5 to 5, the green band here. And we analyze what's the error of the network for any value between minus 20 to 20. The different lines are just versions of the function that we are using for the network, but it's not too important. The key bit here on this plot is that for many of the networks in the range where we train, minus 5 to 5, the network is doing well. As soon as you go out of this range, minus 5 to 5, for example, minus 10 or 20, your network certainly starts having a loss. Right? So networks kind of, you can think of it as they kind of memorize data. They don't understand data. That is the biggest problem uh, regarding generalization. So what does this mean? You, it's just an identity function. You might be thinking, yeah, nobody cares about identity functions. We care about videos and autonomous vehicles and so on. But this actually has huge implications. Why? Because of something called the open world problem. It's a very fundamental problem in artificial intelligence. 
can you guys tell me what's on this sign? Stop, stop sign, exactly. So that's a stop sign, very easy. Uh, you might be able to see it, but there is some spray paint on the, on the stop sign. But this was in our data set. We've trained our network on it. Perfect, no problems. Uh, it can still recognize it. Can you tell me what's on this sign? The same thing. But if you ask our network, it would say 45 million miles per hour limit. Interestingly, the way we've come up with those pixels, with those stickers, is actually an adversarial attack. We've analyzed the network and figured out that if we put those stickers there, the network would be confused, right? So what this means is that you can give me any network, you can train it on as much data as you want, and I'll be able to say, OK, I'll put this sticker there, maybe a bit of blue there, and suddenly your network would stop working. That's a huge problem, especially once you put millions of dollars into data, the whole process of training, and so on. How many of you have heard the fact that Facebook have better than human uh, face recognition? Yeah? Some of you have heard it. Well, not quite. If you want to avoid face recognition by Facebook or anyone else, just wear those glasses. <laughs> right? So this will, this will actually make you undetectable by the models, I guess, in 2016, which, uh, when this work was published. But you can do the same glasses for modern models, no problem. So hopefully, I've convinced you that there is something seriously uh, off going on about neural networks and their generalization capabilities. They can certainly generalize a lot, but once it actually becomes safety critical, we really, we really have to question it. The next problem is interpretability. So you, you make this huge neural network, it typically has gigabytes and gigabytes of parameters. And by parameters, I mean floats in the GPU or the RAM, doesn't matter. So very recently, AlphaStar, again by DeepMind, they won against uh, a human expert player um, in, in this very interesting game. If you go to the official blog post, there is no paper yet, but if you go to the official blog post, you would read something like this. More specifically, the neural network architecture applies a transformer torso to the units, similar to the relational deep reinforcement learning combined with a deep LSTM core and autoregressive policy head with a pointer network and a centralized value baseline. I have no clue. What this reminds me of is this thing. <laughs> right? And this is what happens very often nowadays. We tend to throw as much, as many modules and as much complication as we can imagine in order to get some result out. But if we are to inspect the system and be able to say something about the system, it's really just this pile of data. And yeah, that's, this has huge implications from, for what our technology can do right now. What's the first implication? I would really wouldn't step into a vehicle that has a neural network anywhere on it. Especially not a tested one, not a verified one. And, and, and so on. Trust me, I've been in a vehicle moving 40 miles per hour just in the, with the laptop in my lap. I, yeah, it was scary. So yeah, don't do it, don't do it. And especially don't be a pedestrian around such a vehicle. That's, that's a, a hint. Next thing, so yeah, autonomous vehicles. In fact, autonomous vehicles is a very interesting case because it's really the first, the first autonomous system that we, try, we really try to implement, which is going to penetrate our society, our daily lives. We have those huge factories, um, manufacturing sites, where usually people don't go there. But vehicles, they have to be around people, and that's a, that's a big question. Okay, so autonomous vehicles, that's certainly a problem. Would you trust a black box, uh, a black box doctor? 2017, there was this huge paper where they said, look, we can actually use neural networks to detect um, skin cancer. This was great. And it's actually very interesting, very interesting work. And doctors nowadays, I know that they do use those, such things, but they only use them as more information about the decision that the doctor should ultimately take. Why? If you read the paper, that's the name, you can find it. If you read the paper, it says something very funny in one of the paragraphs describing the, the problems at the end. It turns out that doctors, once they identify uh, a cancer, a cancerous um, formation, only then they put this ruler. And if this is your data set, at the end it turns out that the network learns that there is a ruler which says this is cancer rather than actually identifying what cancer is. So that's a huge implication. You're introducing bias in the data without you realizing, just the way you gather data. And because networks are just a black box, you have input data, output data, you cannot really tell it what's meaningful to you and what not. 
that's why this is a serious problem. Okay, hopefully now I've convinced you there is some issues with interpretability. Okay, the last one is the amount of data and computational resources. This is really going insane. So, 2018, uh, DeepMind again published this paper where they showed that if they play, I don't know, 44 million frames, they can do better than, than humans again, and they can do much, much better than humans with 200 million frames. So what this means is that you have to be able to play for 70 days straight, non-stop, to be able to, to reach this. Is it really realistic? I can tell you how to play an Atari game for maybe 10 minutes, especially if I can show you maybe five. So there is something fishy going on. We need too much data to actually get some simple stuff going on. The next problem is how much this actually costs and what effects it actually has on the environment around us. And it really does have effects. So this was very recent from this year. I think somewhere at some point, uh, some researchers show that if you are to train the best model for some sort of natural language processing task, um, which was state of the art in January 2019, if you do it on the cloud, it will cost you around $3 million. So it's really expensive, which means it's expensive because we do waste energy. We use lots of energy, and if you analyze the CO2 footprint of such a uh, process of training such a network, you generate this many pounds of CO2, which is equivalent to the lifetime emissions of CO2 of five average American cars. And you can do it for like a week. Is it really worth it? Should we really do it? It's an interesting question. So I've shown you that there is another problem, which is the amount of resources. Okay, so what can we do? Now comes the interesting bit. We are developers. And very often people say, I hear linear regression, developers hear if statements. Maybe that's true, maybe that's true, not always, trust me. But it really starts begging the question, can we actually do something about, rather than the poor programmer sitting down, going through hours and hours of data and writing a single if statement, maybe extracting this if statement from data? Can we actually do that? The answer is yes. And in fact, this is one of the, this is really the first reason when people started thinking about AI actually um, decided to do AI because they were interested in finding mathematical proofs automatically, which is very similar to finding programs automatically. And the technical term for this thing is inductive program synthesis. And now I'm going to teach you inductive program synthesis very quickly in a couple of slides. So, can anyone tell me what's the function which takes this input and produces such an output? Yes, to the power of two, very well. Okay, nice and simple, right? Now, what does this simple function imply? A few things. The first one, it generalizes to any n. If you manage to learn it and extract it from data, it will work on any n. Regardless if it's minus, even infinity, plus infinity, you'd get the mathematically sensible answer. It's interpretable. You know exactly what it's doing. It's taking the number two and raising it to the power of n. You know where it will work, where it won't work, if it's going to break, all sorts of things. And lastly, we needed only four examples to be actually able to induce this function. Right? If you were to train a network, trust me, four data points, regardless of how simple the network is, they won't be enough. Okay, another, another uh, problem. How can we generate this sequence? What was the code? What, what's the, the relation in this sequence? Plus two, okay, yeah. You can think of it as plus two. If you write a Python program, it will look like this x for x in range 1 to 11, and you take x only if x is divisible by 2. Very good. Now, what you should realize is that computers are stupid. They do exactly what you tell them. We like this program, but there is so much bias in this program that you can't even imagine. What's the bias? Well, if you throw a standard induction technique at this problem, it's very likely you'd get an answer like this. Right? You'd get an answer from minus 100 to 100, uh, if it's divisible, and then you do this extra filtering in there, you can get that. It's relatively okay. It's not great, but it's okay. 
you can get even something crazier. If you said, I'm actually going to think for about polynomials and actually going to use program induction to find some polynomial, you can even get this program. And if you solve this polynomial, these are the solutions to the polynomial. And it's a valid program, but it's not the program that you need. So you have to be able to somehow specify what bias you want. But that's actually good. By you saying what bias you want, you're saying what properties you actually care about. You say, this is what's really important for my system. For example, safety, low failure rate, detecting objects, and so on. Then you can explicitly put in your program. So even though bias typically is a bad thing, in this case, us being able to provide bias to the system is one of the best things about inductive program synthesis. So what? I'm going to show you, this is some of my work on program induction. It's a we're not going to go in details because we don't have time. If you want to talk about more about it after this, find me and talk to me. But the whole idea is that, as I, as I said, we extract programs from data. In this case, data is this demonstration of a very simple task on a 2D screen of a person stacking cubes in a somewhat simulated 2D physical world. It's essentially, you have to find a program that's going to recreate the clicks that the person did. Right, And the way we do it is we have this architecture. There is a couple of papers on this, if you're interested. Uh, two crucial bits about this work. The first one is we use functional programs. Why do we use functional programs? Because functional programs map one-to-one -to, -one to neural networks, more precisely to computational graphs, which are neural networks. Because this is the case, we can take a random program and optimize it in this tight loop with standard deep learning techniques. So we are using techniques from deep learning, but for the purpose of optimizing a program. You can think of optimizing, for example, the values and the parameters that we are going to pass to a function call. So this is what this optimization is doing. It's a continuous optimization with some uh, interesting features. The, the second bit is we have this searching kind of mechanism where we have a queue of candidate solutions that are mo the most optimal solution or uh, the most optimal program of this form, meaning it has this many function calls, it has this structure of the function call, and so on. Right? And once we, essentially when our Pi machine wants to work, wants to find a solution, we always fetch the best so far program, we check if it's a solution, if it's a solution, we return it and we celebrate, we found the problem. If not, we try to find new ones. And the way we find new ones is also very interesting. We try to gradually expand the complexity of our program. Instead of, for example, having a single argument, maybe we'll say this has to actually be computed by some function call. So I'm going to induce what function, what parameters, and so on. So we're slowly kind of growing the tree of the program, the graph of the program, until we find a solution. So this is how the Pi machine works. So what can you do with it? One thing you can do is you can do physics. So some experiments that we did, you take a demonstration of a pendulum uh, moving in space. So you take the x, the, the angle, and the velocity of the angle. And you, you just say, I want to find a program that's going to take the current state of the pendulum and predict what's going to be the next state, as easy as that. And if you run it on the Pi machine very quickly, in a couple, in, in actually 30 iterations, in 30 loops, you would find this program, which, if you think about it, is exactly what Newton found, I don't know how many years ago. This is f equals ma, just incorporated here. What this means now is that we saw a single demonstration, a single system, but we induced a property that holds amongst any other mechanical system. So that's really powerful. So this really helps us generalize, as long as we can uh, find those invariances in the data, which scientists typically find. We can do the same thing for another physical system that's a bit more complicated, which has some damping and a spring. But not only that. So I've told you about neural networks and the problems they have. So we did the following experiment. You take a neural network, you train it to play the pong game, and neural networks are really good at the pong game. They become better than humans, much better than humans. The problem is they are black boxes. We don't know what they do. Uh, if your life depends on a network playing pong, don't. You would not, yeah. So what we did is we extracted a trace from the network playing the pong game, and we put this trace through the Pi machine. What was the result? After a while, Actually, after only a few iterations, not many. We're not doing millions and billions of iterations. We found solution number two, which says something like, I'm going to move according to, proportional to, with some coefficient, to the difference between the position of the bow and the agent. 
right? And suddenly, this makes sense, right? We are doing proportional control with respect to the distance between us and the bow, and this is what we want. The network is minimizing this distance constantly such that we hit the bow. Not only this, but if we run it a bit more, we understand something about the environment of the network. It turns out that it actually prefers those two different coefficients. The performance is slightly better because there is some friction in the environment. And the Atari game has some physics, which the network obviously also learns. And we here explicitly say, from these coefficients, we can say, was the friction, was the dumping in the system, and so on. So the numerous parameters of the Pong game, really numerous, like I think this one had two gigabytes of floats in the GPU, we can really condense to two lines of code, nothing else. I'll be more than happy to write a vehicle that has two lines of code rather than a big neural network with gigabytes of parameters. You might be thinking, okay, there is something, there is no free lunch theorem, right? There is no free lunch. So what's, what's going on? What do we lose? Well, it turns out we lose a bit of performance. I think it, it's fixable, but let's assume we lose a bit of performance. How much? Humans on this game do 9.3 on average. DQNs, the network does 18.9. And our program agent, which is the, uh, this one actually, is doing 11.1. .1. So we're still better than humans. Not as best as we can, but we are still better than humans. And for many technologies, this is what counts. Are you better than a person? Are you better than current state? Uh, can you actually improve things? We don't really need the ideal, most perfect solution. We need solutions that are better than what we currently have. And the last thing, if you do the Pi machine on the, for example, on the demonstration I showed you of building a, a tower, you can induce this program, which if you inspect, if you think about it, what it means, first we figure out there is a parameter that we need to use everywhere, and we have to pass it to each function call. We have to use the variables that we are aware of in the environment, i.e. things that we care about in this particular order. And if you interpret this program, if you just reason about it, it turns out that we've learned the relation above. And now this relation, our robot, if it's to redo the task, can do it easily because it knows this relation and this relation holds in any environment the robot exists. Okay, so now you're thinking, that's very cool. Now I'm going to go back to my development and, and uh, JavaScript and Python and so on and forget about this. Well, this technology is already coming out. There are already applications for this and they do impact our life. If you've used Excel, come on, admit you've used Excel. I know, don't hide. Um, you can do things like you can put this A here and then you can mark it, you can drag the, the whole thing and it will actually populate the column with what you expect. Some of you probably don't with a number, you put one, two, you drag and it induces the fact that you have to, you want to increase the, the number. Well, the way this works in Excel, behind the scenes, what's happening is you have a system that actually induces a program, in this case working on strings, that actually produces what you want. So inductive program synthesis is already in tools like Excel. Something else, I found this really cool company, we're trying to work together called Bylam. Uh, in Israel, what they have is they have come up with an amazing system where they try to solve the problem of uh, API integration and module uh, kind of uh, transformation of data. So very often you have some data, but you need it in some other format. And if you're a big, slightly bigger comp company, you probably have data in different languages, different uh, formats and so on. And you might end up with somebody having to do something in a language that they don't know. And it's just hard to do anyway. So the system that they've developed, for example, is again based on inductive program synthesis. And what it gives you is at the end, it can specify every single thing, like all the transformations done for this. It can generate the code, be it Python, JavaScript, whatever you need, and also produces the data at the end. So only from a few examples, you can actually transform and induce the code to do it. So imagine something that would be extremely boring. It would take a couple of days. Now we can do it with pretty much an hour just playing with this system. Not only this, but it has even a better feature, right? Imagine you have a database of 15, thousand lines with some data and you have to transform it. You have to go one by one, see if it holds, if not. They have a really cool feature which says, translate for me only those 15 items and I'll be able to do everything for you, right? So now your job is find somebody to translate those 15 lines and then everything else will be sorted. Not only this, you'd get the program that solves it for any new data you get in. Quite interesting. So where am I going with this? Neural networks tend to work, and many machine learning models tend to work in the following way. We have some raw data, we get the model, and we make a decision. And it's really just this transition, nothing else. What we really should be thinking about 
and we as the programmers are the people who can push this forward, is the following. We can use neural networks for extracting information from raw data, which is multidimensional, like images, video, and so on. They're really the best tool for this. But only extract it up to some level that you care about of some variables, some entities in the environment, and only then pass it through a program that you can then understand, inspect, and so on, to make a decision. This makes your life much easier. And I'll show you just a couple of examples of how this can be applied even to robotics. So in robotics, there is this big problem called the symbol grounding problem. Uh, what's the problem? Well, we want the robot to build this tower. Maybe we can generate, use a planner and generate the plan for it. That's easy, we know how to do it. And the plan is something like this. The problem is the robot operates in pixels. It perceives in pixels. There is no way for the robot to know that this yellow cube variable here is actually this bunch of pixels over there. So we have to be able to teach it somehow. But if you have this programmatic description of the plan, you can do things. Come and talk to me uh, about it more if you're interested. And they would allow you to learn even a 3D model of the object, right? Just mapping what pixels correspond to the plan and to the variables in the plan, absolutely automatically, from a single demonstration from a person. And here we can see, like, once we do this demonstration, because we've learned those symbols, now we can put the cubes anywhere you want, move the, the, the task, change the task as much as you want as in the environment, but the robot would still be able to solve it because it has the knowledge of this is how this looks like and this is the procedural programmatic task I have to solve. And we have the best languages for both sorts of tasks, perception and decision making. Using the same sort of techniques, you can do even something else. You can do something called intention uh, detection or intention recognition. You can see me assembling one robot with the help of another robot. I told you we had too many robots. So, by the bread robot called Baxter, knowing what my task is programmatically, and me wearing some very interesting equipment called eye tracking glasses, you can see this dot, there are just some glasses which actually tell the robot where I'm looking at. It can actually absolutely automatically, without me saying anything, doing anything special, induce what I'm doing and help me automatically. So I'm not, I'm not wasting even a single percent of my cognitive capabilities to communicate with the robot and actually have an assistant. It's very similar to what a skilled team of some, uh, I don't know, craftsmen actually do, right? They've worked so much together that they understand each other from their actions because they understand the whole process. And the last thing, so I, I said two months ago, I decided I'm going to start this uh, Cyro company doing those interesting things. We want to be based in Sofia. I moved back to Sofia. And what we're going to do, starting from in a couple of months, is an AI masterclass. So if you're interested, definitely sign up here. You get the invitation to apply for the masterclass when it's open. And I hope it really will be the way for you to learn a lot about those things happening in the world. And I hope it will be the way to actually start building this very important and needed AI ecosystem here in Sofia and Bulgaria. Thank you very much. I'm so happy we have this on video, so we can watch it a couple more times. We have time for two questions, maybe. Who is willing to ask something? Hi. I had Hello. one question about the Pi machine. Mm -hmm. um, namely, you said that you used uh, neural networks to optimize the program later on. Mm, no. No, OK. Yes. I, what I said is we can think of pro the programs, the functional programs, yeah. as computational graphs. Mm -hmm. which is the way we think about neural networks, and then we can optimize the programs as fast as we can optimize neural networks. Okay. Only certain features from the program, not the whole program. Okay, because what I wanted to ask is if you could apply sort of like a genetic algorithm to optimize the program. Yeah, so the first actually reason genetic algorithms came about, they were actually called genetic programming. Mm -hmm. It was for programs. The fact that we can actually use what neural networks are using means that we can do search that's much more targeted. Genetic programming is just kind of, I'll do something almost brute force, not really, but almost brute force. Whereas if you do gradient descent, what neural networks are doing, it's much faster, much more targeted. So the Pi machine actually was the state of the art method for doing this sort of stuff when it got published a couple of years ago. And yeah, so it's, it's really much faster than standard methods of symbolically searching. Another question? Hey, thanks for the great talk. I, uh, my question is, how do you know how to disrupt a, an AI 
uh, like the introduction with the pixels on the stop mm -hmm. sign, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously get a, get an idea that, that there's an AI at the back end, but how do you know how to disrupt it or is it a trial and error and, uh, until it no, gets it's, stuck? It, so it depends on the mode of attack. So there's this whole field called adversarial attacks for machine learning. And if you have access to the network, it's extremely easy. I can feed the value in, I can see how I should change my input to get the value out. If you don't have access to the network, you can approximate this by a couple of examples. And you can see, essentially, because you know what the network is, the network is some sort of function that has gradients flowing, and you can actually induce what the, the direction of this is. So it's very easy to confuse networks, especially adversarially. Now there are some methods coming out, especially exactly this year. So this is something happening right now, where you can train the network and prove that your network won't break for the training data. So this is still a step forward. And the last quick question. I'm sorry, I had another question. Of course. Um, if I understood you correctly, um, this program synthesis that happens, you give it like a plan as to what it has to do, and then the robot sort of related to your last. Yeah, uh, the last, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the robot sort of derives based on the plan, it looks at it blocks and derives the distance between each block and sort of uses this plan as after it derives the distance to know how to put them together. So what actually happened? So the, the, the last bit is more of a, if you have some programmatic description of your task, you can feed this into your perception learning pipe mm -hmm. and you can actually tell the network, look, this is the structured data, the structured representation of the task. Use this to actually learn from as little data as possible. And the work I showed you was we, it learned from a single demonstration of a person doing this task. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the last bit was if you know the program, you can actually help networks learn better. And we have no more time for questions. One more time, this was Dr. Clinton. Thank you. Thank you.